Hello and welcome to another A Tippling Philosopher video. This is myself, Jonathan M. S. Pierce, and I am uh, particularly excited to be joined today uh, by, well, I'm not going to be talking sort of the general religion, uh, philosophy of religion, uh, or am I? And in fact, that's something we're going to talk about tonight because I'm joined by Chris Shelton, who is a former Scientologist of 27 years. That's not his age, that's his um, like indentured servitude. And uh, we are going to be discussing whether, you know, Scientology is a religion, whether it's a cult uh, and uh, so on and so forth. Um, so anyway, uh, Chris, welcome to the show. Really, really great to have you here. Thank you very much for having for asking me to be on. I'm happy to be here. Excellent. Um, and I know I said this to you before. I know you will have done this a thousand times. But for those who are un uninitiated, uh, could you give us a brief? Um, well, I guess. Give us a brief introduction to yourself, and then with that, a brief introduction introduction as to what Scientology is. Cool. Absolutely. Uh, so I'm Chris Shelton. Um, I was basically raised in a Scientology household, and that's, you know, how, how I got on this path to sit here in front of you today. Um, I got really heavily involved with it after I finished my schooling. Um, I was recruited to become a staff member and work for the Church of Scientology, and I did that for eight years in Santa Barbara, California. And uh, that was, I joined when I was, I, I started working for the church when I was 17 years old, so I fresh faced out of high school. Um, the only job I'd held really up until then was flipping burgers at Burger King. And so not a lot of real world experience, in other words. And then uh, when I was 25 years old, I decided to double down because I wasn't achieving my goals uh, with Scientology. We were not, in other words, taking over the world fast enough. And so I decided that I would join what's called the Sea Organization, uh, S-E-A, like the ocean, the Sea Organization, which is kind of Scientology's core membership, its core fanatical base, you could say. And those are the, when you hear about in Scientology, everybody's heard about the billion-year contract that you sign. That's the Sea Org. Right? Not all Scientologists do that, but the Sea Org does. And I signed one of those contracts when I was 25 years old, and I worked for the organization for another 17 years after that. Uh, so uh, a lot of years involved. I got out when I was, uh, when I, I finally, you know, kind of got out of the headspace and uh, escaped from it in 2013. And, um, and I have been sort of speaking out against destructive cults, uh, Scientology being the first and foremost, because it's the one I have the most experience with. But I've also done interviews and talks about um, the Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, the cultic aspects of the of the Latter-day Saints, the uh, Bill Gothers, you know, various Christian cults and groups, as well as non-religious organizations that act in a coercively controlling fashion, like um, you know, Enron or Nexium or some of these other groups, or I've even interviewed uh, a, a man who was part of a cult that formed up in a martial arts dojo, because they can happen anywhere. So, and, uh, okay, well, let, let's start with that then. What, how would you define a cult? Okay, well, a destructive cult is sort of what I like to focus the wording on, because the English definition of the word cult is certainly sufficient, and you'll find it in the dictionary as a hardcore group of people aligned around a common idea or purpose or advocates for, you know, very strong advocates for particular, you know, uh, ideas. You also have definitions of cult that really just mean a religion or a group of people. Um, and the word comes from culture. They have the same root, cult, culture, so that's kind of where the ideas of of it originally came from. But in the nineteen in the early nineteen hundreds, um, fundamentalist Christians decided to start referring to, if I have my history right here, non fundamentalist groups as cults, and that's how it kind of got its more derogatory, pejorative terminology now. And it's a pretty loaded word. A lot of people have a lot of yeah. different ideas about it, and so I immediately go, okay destructive cults are what I talk about. And that means it's right in the title. It's a group of people who are 
to whatever degree of awareness they have about the situation they are in, they are being coercively controlled, which means they are being isolated, manipulated, and controlled through deceitful and um, uh, there is a lack of informed consent <laughs> as to what's going to happen to the person in the group. They, they are not upfront about what's going on. So we tend to define these groups or look at these groups by the characteristics of the groups. And, uh, and there's a whole you know, checklist I use that is not a diagnostic tool. It's just sort of a rough guide for what the kind of things you would find in destructive cults. Um, mantras, chanting, fanaticism, you know, the leader is all and everybody else is nothing. A group of people who believe they have the truth with a capital T and everybody else is lost. That, that sort of thinking is what you see in destructive cults. And that's what I was part of for many, many decades. So what, what, okay. So let's have a, now a little sort of very quick synopsis of what Scientology is and and then maybe how it qualifies as a coercive cult as a destructive cult sure absolutely um so the church of scientology was the brainchild of l ron hubbard and he was a science fiction fantasy author pulp fiction author from the uh born in 1911 and uh he started up with a, a, an idea of replacing psychology and psychiatry with a new science of mental health called Dianetics. And this was a book that he published in 1950. And he first, it wasn't about religion, it was about science. But L. Ron Hubbard was no scientist. And he couldn't, he couldn't, you know, laboratory his way out of a wet paper bag. He was just awful at science. And his theories and his ideas were basically rewrapped or relabeled hypnotism as Hubbard was a hypnotist. And he used hypnotism in a, in a covert fashion and drugs and other things in order to uh, create states of mind in people where they achieved euphoric or awe states. They felt amazing, in other words. And, you know, taking trips down memory lane and remembering things when you were three years old that happened to you and that kind of thing is not the sort of thing that your average consumer does on a day-to-day -day basis. So when they are put into this counseling format and told that this is how your mind works and this is how you relieve tension and stress and trauma, they go, oh, okay, that sounds good. And that's what happened in 1950. And so Dianetics really took America by storm. And it was, an, it was a legit bestseller. And from that, foundations were formed and people started using the Dianetics techniques on one another. Hubbard, being the showman that he was, heavily overpromised and underdelivered. And so Dianetics tanked twice. It actually got a bailout from a millionaire in Kansas, and then he tanked it again. Because he just was he just was not a very good <laughs> organizationalist or businessman. And he was kind of pocketing all the money, Hubbard was, right? Yeah, so, yeah. so then he lost the rights to Dianetics. And uh, in the second bailout, he had to sign over or share the rights of Dianetics with this other man, Don Purcell. So he decided after he parted ways with Purcell, and this was after he had already parted ways with every other supporter who had actually helped him to write and produce Dianetics and make it the bestseller that it was, all of those people were, were cast aside in the first two years of its release. So Hubbard sort of hit the reset button and decided that this uh, old idea that he'd had, which he had shared with people earlier, other writers and whatnot, is that the real money is in starting a religion. And well, like he had a quote, didn't he? You don't get rich writing science fiction. If you want to get rich, you start a religion. I mean, that was literally one of his quotes. That's right. And he decided to make good on that. And so he started a whole new subject, which he called Scientology. And Scientology is, uh, well, let me be really blunt for anybody who's watching this and just say straight up, it's a money-making scam. And it's, uh, it, it is not designed to help you. It is not designed to be of, of assistance to you. It's all smoke and mirrors. It is a set of coercively controlling techniques that, in that basically enable a sort of hypnotic trance to be entered. It's a trance-inducing series of steps or techniques or processes. And there are many, many, many of them in the, in the whole body of work that is Scientology. 
And the idea is to, um, again, create these sort of awe, euphoric states in people where they will be so amazed and delighted and blown out of their heads, so to speak, that they will then start, you know, turning over cash hand over fist. And Hubbard was, uh, Hubbard, there's, there's a lot of layers to Hubbard, but just to kind of keep it at the surface level, he was a scammer and a con artist. And he was all about the money and he was all about the women and he was all about the sex and he was all about, you know, everything else. And, um, and that's kind of how the how he rode the success of Scientology. He he built it up again on the backs of others who he then trashed and and uh, cast aside when they started speaking out against what he was doing. And there's a long trail of those from 1950 forward. Uh, I mean, I guess you could say I'm one of those. Yeah. You know, even after <laughs> after Hubbard died, which was in 1986, I. I very uh, strong proponent of Scientology. So, um, so anyway, that's kind of the, the 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 genesis of it. It grew through the 1950s, and by 1960, Hubbard set up shop in England, uh, north of where you're at now, up in uh, East Grinstead. Yeah, so just along the coast um, in in Sussex, there I, well, I used to go to college in a place called Brighton, and East Grinstead's fairly close to that. And that I that's where I first heard about Scientology. Is like, oh, East Grinstead's the the head of the Church of Scientology, and the, the general opinion is that they're all like wacko type, whatever. You know, it is, j- j- you know, we're we're pretty. I mean, in Britain, we're we're really quite anti-religious in a very cultural way. That's just like, yeah, you know. But uh, but yeah, and and that you know it was it had a bit of an you know not an aura to it. It had a bit sort of you know these rumors about it as a, as a sort of place because Scientology, no one really knew what was going on. No one really understood what it was. Um, but yeah, so yeah, East Grinstead. But where, where so where's the main area in in the states for Scientology? Um, oh, okay. So as it grew, um, it, he set up shop in England. That was the international base until he started the Sea Organization in 1967, went on to the ocean, and then came back to land in Clearwater, Florida. And I think it was 1974, 74, 75 time period. And ever since then, Clearwater, Florida has been the international sort of service headquarters and main base for Scientology. The management of Scientology organizations around the world moved to California in the um, late 1970s, uh, along with Hubbard. He had to flee Clearwater because he was wanted by various authorities for tax evasion and various other things. And uh, well, that, that's interesting. It's tax evasion because that appears to be a, a running theme with Scientology. Well, that's exactly right. In fact, his um, escape to the ocean in 1967 was preceded by the fact that the IRS revoked the church's tax exemption. They had, they had gained tax exemption as a church, as a, as a religious operation in the United States in 1956. And they took it away in 67 because they found Hubbard was personally profiting to what would be at this time, you know, converted rates would be millions and millions of dollars. He was just absconding with money all over the place. But now it's still now it's back again as being a religion and taxes exempt. Is that is that correct? Well, it's always been a religion, but the tax exemption status of it is what was revoked. And so they've been recognized in the courts as a legit religion. And that's believe me, there's a very low bar are for that right so that's you know that's no accomplishment um but the tax exemption was a big deal losing it was a big deal and hubbard was being pursued by various authorities over the years and he was also an extremely paranoid and megalomaniacal kind of guy so even when he wasn't being actively pursued he bragged about how he was i mean he 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 would talk about this and use this as for fear-mongering and for more income demand and things like that all through the years until he died and over the years he became more and more and more paranoid more and more senile more and more nuts in other words and is that, is that how the organization started to become um, coercive is it, is it is it was it a top-down thing or do you think it grew out of the the sort of organization it was and the people it was recruiting or both do oh you know no, what I mean? I'm, I'm interested in how how 
an organization like that just becomes this fair gaming coercive organization it is nowadays right it's a it's an alter ego the or the organization of scientology and all of the written and and recorded policies and guidelines that scientology operates on are all an alter ego of hubbard they yeah. reflect hubbard's personality he he wrote his personality into the dna of the organization itself and the subject and so if you become a Scientologist, and this is not true for only for Scientology, this is true for almost all cults, is that you will see um, vast and disturbing personality changes in the adherents and the followers. And that those followers are taking on more and more of the personality traits of the leader. That's mm -hmm. part of what the cult leader follower dynamic is all about, is the followers want to not only emulate they kind of want to be the founder or the leader and so they take on more and more of the of the leader's characteristics as they see or perceive it so um and this is reinforced by things like uh mantras and chants and things like that but in scientology you have the question always being asked of scientologists when faced with a problem or difficulty that they're having well what would ron do what right. Would yeah, do, yeah. Right? Yeah. Not, what should I do? That's never the question. The question is, what would Ron do? And that's how you're supposed to deal with that problem. So it's it's subtle, but over it's, time, that matters. That kind of subtlety makes a difference in a person's viewpoints and attitudes. Does it have any kind of theology? You know, because I look at things, I'm always attacking like religions for their theology and the, for the philosophical um claims that, that are entailed uh and yet with i don't really know enough about scientology but but i guess you know if, it, if it's essentially a pseudo psychology textbook type thing then uh, you know is there like moral dictats is, is there a moral framework that it's saying that people should live to is there a theology to it or is it absent of that Oh, no, there's very much uh, a lot of that. There's a cosmology, there is a theology, there are services, there are rituals. It's a full-blown religion in that sense, but it defines itself, and this is a little important to understand because there are differences between what Scientology is as a quote-unquote religion and, say, the Christianity or um, even Judaism. There's no God figure in Scientology. It's not a worship. Scientology is, is, de describes itself as an applied religious philosophy. It's something that you do more so than it's something that you're believing in. But believe me, there's all kinds of crazy beliefs going on in Scientology. I, I was fell prey to almost every single one of them at one point or another. Excuse me. So, um, so it, there is a belief set. And there are rules and there is a moral code. In fact, there are many moral codes in Scientology uh, dictating behavior across all kinds of, uh, you know, people and situations in the world of Scientology. Where did they where did they come from? Was, it, was that what L. Ron Hubbard put in there or have they been developed over time? And if it's from L. Ron Hubbard, where did he did he just sort of make them up out of like his sci fi thinking or has he nicked them from other religions or all of the above? Uh, all of the above. Um, as with everything, everything borrows from everything else. And in Hubbard's case, he was a pretty shameless plagiarist. He borrowed extensively from anybody who had a good idea. And all kinds of people over the years, followers of Hubbard's, suggested and gave him all kinds of ideas and really fundamental ideas to what the Scientology religion sort of believes. Uh, a lot of it came from, uh, you know, contributions or followers, but Hubbard never credited any of them. It was always him. It was always about him. And he was quite adamant that people weren't supposed to be making money off this. All that money was his. And this is why I say I throw words around like megalomaniac. I mean, he was yeah. very, I mean, he, he, this is, these are not words I use uh, lightly. These are words I use very exactly. And he was a narcissist and he was a megalomaniac. And, and he was, and he was, you know, to, to uh, say colloquially, he was a bit nuts, you know. 
uh, he had a lot of layers to him, like I said, and we can get into some of those layers maybe while we're talking here. But just to, to sort of describe the situation, um, so they present themselves as a religious philosophy because, let me tell you, the core tenet, the core piece of faith to Scientology is that you, me, everybody, we're all spiritual entities or spiritual beings called thetans. That's the word that they use. They don't use soul or spirit or ghost. They use thetan. Same thing. It's a spirit. It's non-material, non-corporeal entity that is alive, yet it has no real material existence. And so you have to take it as an article of faith that you are this entity, and yet you don't actually exist in the physical universe. Your body does. And your body is sort of a conduit for the spirit to be able to communicate and move around and do things in the real world. Um, but the real existence, the only true existence, is your spiritual existence. And the idea with Scientology and what it promises, the, the carrot, so to speak, is that um, you are a god. You are like a god. You are, And that, I don't mean that in terms of worship. I mean in terms of power and ability and awareness, and you have the capability and potential of creating your own universe. This universe is just what we all agree is here. It's sort of an illusion that it's like a mass delusion kind of thing that we're all taking part in. And Hubbard promises that by doing the techniques and going up the levels of indoctrination of Scientology, you will become an advanced, immortal, you'll realize your spiritual potential, and you will regain your spiritual immortality. Because the idea is that you can't die. You don't die. There is no death for you as a spirit. So when you when this body dies that you inhabit right now, you're just going to go get another one and lead another life in this physical universe. And which link, yeah, which links up. I mean, it all sounds like a computer game. You go up the levels until you get to the boss level and job done. But yeah. um, uh, I guess this this brings on like the repressed memories. And because there are elements of the, the dianetics, with, which is a lot of psychology and some of it does actually hit on real psychology. I guess it's kind of hit and miss. And there is little nuggets of, of actual stuff going on there. And hence, there must be something that works. Otherwise, you, you'd be selling nothing. Um, so then it must give something to people in terms of what's going well, on. It with does. It gives people awe and, and, you know, euphoria and these amazing experiences. But it then the, the trickery to this, see, there's the, the it, when, when people use the word works with Scientology, my, my hackles go up a little bit only because it works but it's, it's not working the way you think it works. And it's not doing what you think it's doing. It doesn't, it, it's all deception. There are so yeah. many. So some, something is going on. Like it's something is happening. And, happening. and I recognize that something is happening. Therefore, woohoo. <laughs> exactly. And see, because the thing about all the things that happen to you in Dianetics and Scientology is that you are told very carefully and very precisely, there are very exact techniques. This is not a wishy-washy, roll-your-own sort of religion. The, the techniques and processes of Scientology are precise. And they are meant to be done in specific sequences, in specific ways. There is a, a dictum in Scientology that there is only one right way to do anything. And that uh, if you are going to do Scientology, you better do it the right way because anything altered or uh, changed or twisted and you are doing something else. And that's not OK. And they actually have a label for that. If you go off and do Scientology on your own or uh, without the approval of the church or you go changing things, they call you a squirrel. So this is uh, this is actually brings me on to a question I, I had for you, which is. When you look at all other religions, you see multiple denominations as as schisms happen and people split off and do this. But I, I would imagine there aren't really any denominations of Scientology. There's just Scientology and then not Scientology, but all people doing it on their own, which are squirrels rather than being an act. Is there an organized splinter group at all? Yes, there are. There are a few of them. Ah. Um, they are very tiny groups. I mean, we're talking about you know, maybe a thousand people worldwide who are practicing Scientology actively right now outside of the church. 
Right. And those are called independent Scientologists. And for the most part, they tend to be people who are in a, I don't want to say a phase, but it's sort of like a way station on your way out. You get, right. you realize that the church is oppressing the hell out of you and is doing things to you that are really not okay and are very abusive. And you go, well, that's not cool. But you still think Hubbard had a few good points. So you still think that the procedures and the processes are great, but boy, that David Miscavige, the guy who heads the church now, right? Ah, oh, what an asshole that guy is. Or, uh, oh, can I swear on here? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, no, that's or they have some problem with the organization or something like that. But they that's really similar to sort of Christianity. So you can imagine, yeah. for example, where, yeah. where people get really annoyed with, I don't know, pedophile uh, priests and, and, and the Pope or this and that, and then go, that's right, and it's just a step away from, and then often, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a route out, as you say. Yeah. Exactly. Because what tends to happen is people will hit that way station of still wanting to practice Scientology. But then they find over time, without all the controls and all of the coercive, really coercive control that's going on in the church, things start falling apart. It doesn't work the way it's supposed to, or various other things happen, and they start realizing that Hubbard was a pathological liar, and that nothing he said about his past was true. And therefore, he claimed that he cured his war wounds with Dianetics processing. He never had any war wounds. <laughs> so there was- Look, I'm, I'm cured, I'm perfect. Yeah, but right? you never have any problem. Yeah, so, so it's all based on a lie. And, and once you start learning that, then the bottom starts falling out. And most people look at that and go, wow, I just got fooled really well. Like, wow, you know? And they get pretty upset about it, I sure did. And then they kind of leave the whole thing altogether. Not everybody can actually come to acknowledge that truth, though. Some people must cling to something rather than having nothing. Well, there's an awful lot of cognitive dissonance to consider here because, yeah. of course, you know, and for those who don't know, cognitive dissonance is when you have a core belief uh, and then evidence against your belief Um the, those are those are disharmonious and that disharmony in your brain is not good so you, how do you harmonize these things how does the new evidence get harmonized with the core belief and often it either gets rejected or it gets twisted or the core belief might change a little bit but generally the core belief wins out uh, and so on and so forth and your brain does funky things now with the, this situation when you've got money involved the cognitive dissonance is even more powerful because actually you know as with the work of daniel kahneman we, we can talk about you know chasing uh good money Money with bad or is it bad money with good whatever um and so the idea that you spent a whole bunch of money and this all seems a load of nonsense how, the only way you can justify spending all that money and time and effort and ruining your life or whatever it, it is by still accepting this the, the idea of scientology rather than reject it so that is it's a really powerful mechanism to keep people in there because you know they don't want to admit that it's all been such a waste exactly exactly which is one of the reasons, just as a quick side note, that I push on my channel and in my life critical thinking so hard. Because it, it's only by learning about the logical fallacies and the ways that we have biases and, and you know, these, these sort of filters that our information goes through and that our perceptions even go through, that we learn that we really aren't all that and that we really need to calm down and realize that we are very easily deceived and that it is up to us to discipline our minds to watch for and and be alert for those fa those kinds of logical fallacies and in this case for example you were just mentioning the sunk cost fallacy you know where mm, you yeah. invested and invested and invested and it's like i can't give this up i put so much in there has to be a payoff here and you just aren't willing to acknowledge the fact that no man you got taken for a ride and there is no payoff and there is no rainbow at the end of this road you got to pull out because every penny you're putting into this you're just wasting your money yeah so, 
so uh, and that's that's music to my ears obviously you know critical thinking is is hugely important although we can never any of us escape it escape biases fully nope. like at least knowing about them is is the best we can do to mitigate our behaviors as uh, as best we can that's but right. um I, i'm interested in whether people have ever actually read the book dianetics and then gone into <laughs> into scientology i mean uh, that strikes oh, yeah. me as like really oh, people yeah. have actually read it and gone well this is great and then, like, I, I always assume that people get into it and then read the Dianetics book. Well, that happens. That's how, that's how I got in. But, of course, I was raised in it, yeah, right? Yeah. I'm a second-generation Scientologist. So, or at least I was, right? So that's a whole nother bag of tricks because there's a whole nother levels of nonsense with second-generation members who never had a choice. They're just, mm -hmm. this, is, this is your religion. This is how it is. You're raised in it. You never had any other idea of how the world works than a Scientological point of view. And that was the household I was raised in. So for me, it was never a choice. But for my parents, it was. And um, some people, you know, I, I couldn't really give a percentage, probably more than not, don't read the Dianetics book first. But a lot of people come into Scientology by reading a Scientology book. Yeah. And then they go, well, this looks impressive, or this sounds impressive, or L. Ron Hubbard sounds like he knows what he's talking about. What's this all about? And the, the fundamental sort of conversion process of Scientology is, again, I keep going back to this awe, euphoria experience, because it's really, really important to, you know, that sort of epiphany you need to have in order to feel like, oh, this is the one true answer. This is the thing I've been looking for my entire life. They don't logic you into that. They mm. emote you into it. It is through it, the two big, again, logical fallacies that people will fall into when they get into Scientology is appeal to authority mm. and appeal to emotion. Mm. And they are all about getting the feels out of you. And that's what the auditing process and that sort of covert hypnotism and trance induction, that's what that's all about. But see, they don't frame it as hypnosis or trance induction. You're not willingly going into a hypnotic session. You're being told that you are remembering things from past lives, you know, 7 million years ago. And those memories are so powerful that when you remember them and de-traumatize yourself from them, you feel amazing and you feel great and all of that trauma is gone. Well, that's an interpretation of that feeling, but it's not the right one. Yeah. The feeling's actually coming from the, the fact that they put you in a trance and then you snap out of it and you feel like, wow, I feel great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you assign that I feel wonderful kind of feeling to all these explanations they've given you. And that's how you fall for the con is it's all it's all kind of logically explained to you. But the real selling point is the is the emotion. So what what is it, what are people generally paying for when when they because it, it seems to me like a big giant pyramid scheme where people get sucked in uh, being told that you know the the or you know and come and experience this and maybe I presume you get given some maybe some free auditing which you can explain uh, um, in a second but or sucked in somehow and then it's like and now you're sucked in it's going to cost you this but how does it cost what are people paying for and how do they pay in other ways other than money you know in, 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 sure. in you have um you have a uh <laughs> yeah sorry i just got a little distracted by the uh uh comments here fine this is just one of my shows that i do on yeah. friday this is the my, my live show critical conversation sorry about that um it's a gradual process the very first services of scientology are cheap 50 bucks 100 bucks right buy a book read the book come on in right get we'll give you a free introductory auditing session um you know that kind of thing and that's how you get on board it's sort of a little hook kind of deal right and again if they can induce that awe experience you're sold oh my god this was amazing it went exactly the way you said it would now here's the thing not everybody experiences that and those who don't that this wasn't for me i'm out of here right but you don't hear about those guys because they in out but the people who stay 
get dragged further and further in. And each of the services on this very precisely laid out roadmap that Scientology has, it's called the Bridge to Total Freedom, by the way, that series of indoctrination levels and services becomes progressively more expensive. So the beginning services, the public level services are pretty cheap. 50, like I said, 100 bucks, 200 bucks maybe. Uh, auditing by the hour at that level, the kind of auditing you get, it's very light grade auditing. It's not really very hardcore, heavy duty auditing like you'll get later. Um, it, pretty cheap, you know, 100 bucks, 200 bucks an hour, something like that. It's then when you're sold on it and you become a true believer that the big money starts coming out and they will have a whole series of, of services, like I said, that are very exactly laid out. And by the time you get to the top of the top of this thing, you have invested bare minimum $500,000, likely a million at least. Jesus. And, and I'm interested, these people that move up and do all this, is it, is it, are there any people that are up there going, yeah, I do recognize this is just a big scam and bullshit, but oh, actually yeah, I'm in. Yeah, absolutely. That happens but, at but, all levels. But not but not to leave. But actually, do you reckon there's a lot of people in there who stay in there? Because it's like either I'm making money out of it myself at this point. I don't know how that works. Or like, I don't know. Uh, not that... really. There used to be some of that. But the money-making possibilities within the world of Scientology are few and far between if your all name right. isn't David Miscavige. Yeah. So, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, not a lot. Right. And there used to be a little bit more. There was there were bonus systems and commission systems and things like that. But those go in and out like the tide. And for the most part, like I said earlier, Hubbard was all about it's my money. It's my money. It's my money. And he was he was very Scrooge like when it came to that. So he amassed a, a, a great deal of money. We're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars. And at this point, with real estate valuations and, and cash on hand, we estimate it's a rough estimate that the books are not transparent. We don't have access to them, obviously. But we're figuring, you know, a couple billion dollars worth of valuation there. And uh, interesting. And is it still growing? No, no. Scientology has been shrinking like a sieve for a very long time. They are they have never, ever had millions of Scientologists. That is that that was always a bald faced lie being told by Scientology PRs. The I know for a fact, because I've actually seen the file system and seen the, the name lists, the, the, the peak of Scientology was 750,000 active members, maybe something like that, but or, or total members, people who had ever done anything with it. Um, active membership now, I think a high estimate. 25,000 people, 30,000 people, something like that. Right. Wow. Yeah. So that yeah, that's a that's a that's a huge drop. Yeah. And what and what would you put that down to? Well, all the destructive the fact that it's a destructive cult whose destruction is literally written into its DNA. It's not a sustainable system. You cannot habitually abuse people the way they do and expect to keep growing. Um especially when Hubbard, in his madness in the 1980s, uh, there's a historical piece here, which we don't, I, I, I can't get into the whole story of it because it's a little involved. But Hubbard did a championship job of cutting off at the knees the number one income and people producing route or line for Scientology. He destroyed it utterly in, in, a, in a fit of rage and jealousy and paranoia in the early 1980s. And Scientology, to be honest, really never recovered from that. That was the point where there was an actual schism. Right. There were thousands of Scientologists who took off and went off on to the independent Scientology route because they didn't trust the church anymore. And they actually built, amazingly, the Church of Scientology built itself back after that and survived it. And by 1993, had regained their tax-exempt status. And that was the thing that really ensured that they could continue to operate. So uh, most of their income... That, it would have been game over for them by now. 
Yeah, and that's that's you know that's a really still an important battleground that people have a lot of issue with, rightly. Um, so, what's its main income stream at the moment? Is it its members? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, the money all comes from its membership. They don't. I mean, have, other than uh, they, I presume they've got like um, you know, they must have investments and you sure. know other you know uh, property and stuff like that. Yeah. But uh, but but you send the members are the main. Yeah, see, we don't really know. All I can do is this, right? Because I, we don't know what their investments are, or where their books are, or any of that. They're not transparent. As a religion, they get a free pass on all of that. So we don't, we don't get to know where all their money is and where it's distributed and things like that. But just to, but just to be blunt, I mean, Hubbard was keeping, you know, Swiss bank accounts, Liechtenstein bank accounts. Uh, I mean, he had bank accounts all over the place, and he had couriers members, hardcore Sea Org members, right, his most fanatical loyal people, couriering gold bullion and cash to the tune of millions of dollars to these bank accounts all through the 1970s and 80s. So fun fact, I've slept, I've slept on a roadside in a camper van in Liechtenstein. Anyway, oh. that's not really very relevant. Uh, but <laughs> there you go. Um, so you could drive through it like 20 minutes or something. Yeah, right? yeah it's like, yeah, it's just, oh, I just man. wanted to say. <laughs> so at, at the time I was, uh, I, I was go, driving through uh, um, uh, Europe with my, with my partner and we, we did like 15 countries in three weeks. Cause you can do that in oh, Europe. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, I was sticking stickers of every country on the back of my camper van. So it's like Liechtenstein job done, right? <laughs> Off to the next place job yeah, done. Yeah. But yeah, there you go. Uh, so um, Scientology. So, what then you, i mean you've talked about how it's damaging to people how how is uh before we get onto fair gaming and what that is and how that's yeah. damaging how is the how are the procedures of scientology damaging like yeah uh, let me okay yeah let me let me tell you a little bit about my research on this because i actually i went and got a degree in in the psychology of coercive control after uh, about a uh, actually i just got it uh finished a couple months ago and so I did some original research on this topic of, of what is auditing and how is the framework of it um, coercive. And I think I can explain it pretty quickly by simply telling you, imagine you go to see a psychologist for some therapy, because that's what Scientology or people who are in Scientology sort of analogize the auditing procedure to. You are in a room with a counselor, they're called an auditor. And they use this electronic device called an e-meter in almost all of their auditing. But it's not necessarily a requirement of auditing to use an e-meter. There are non-metered auditing techniques, quite a few of them. But all of them induce trance. All of them. And the idea is that you are put into a room with this so-called counselor who has no formal training of any kind in psychology, psychiatry, mental health. In fact, they eschew and rag on psychology and psychiatry full-time. Scientologists hate psychiatry. Hubbard, again, ragged on it all the time. And yet they use this format of a therapist and a, and a, and a patient-type setup. But when you go into the therapy room to get your counseling, the counselor has the door behind him or her and it's locked and you're in the desk or in the in the chair over there and you don't get to leave until the auditor says you get to leave until the e-meter says you get to leave you and your thoughts and your wants and your desires are the least important part of what's going on in that room the auditor's job is to run a process, and a process in Scientology is a series of commands or questions that are asked of you, often repetitively. This is where the trance induction often comes in, is you are asked the same question over and over and over again. And the questions can be rather innocuous. They don't sound that awful, you know, recall a time that was really real to you. Okay, that's fair enough, right? But you can sit in a room for three straight hours answering that question over and over and over again. And believe me, from personal experience, after about 15 or 20 minutes of that, you are going to be feeling a little weird. And after yeah. an hour of that, you're going to feel like you're out of your damn mind. 
And the idea is that this is this is reframed in an auditing Scientology context as a as a feature, not a bug. Right. In no psychology sessions anywhere are you covertly being put under hypnotic trance, much less not being allowed out of the room if you don't want to if you don't want to be there anymore. If a psychologist is doing a session with you and you go, yeah, I don't want to do this anymore. They stop. Not in Scientology. Yeah. Yeah. You are made and forced to continue the process until the e-meter and the auditor say you are done. And Hubbard advises in his written policies on this that you could sit in that room with that pre-clear. They call them a, the person who's receiving the auditing is called a pre-clear because they're not yet to the state of clear, which we can, which we can get to. So the pre-clear, not the patient, the pre-clear, is stuck in that room until the auditor says they're done. And that might mean no breaks. That might mean all kinds of things. Now, generally speaking, auditors are human beings too. They got to go to the bathroom. They got to eat lunch and dinner and all that. So you will get some breaks. That's a, that's a generally acknowledged thing. But you're not done with the process that has been started on you until they say you're done. And mm -hmm. what they're trying to do is run that process until that euphoria state is achieved. And you're in there until you get it. So you can make that happen. And it, is that, is, it happen slowly. Is the pressure to get a euphoria state a financial pressure? Yes, because you're paying by the hour to be in there. Yeah. But, but, and, and I wonder, is, 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 do, you, do the auditors see it as such? The auditors will use that as leverage to get you to cooperate. I'll tell you, uh, for example, I'll tell you, um, there are there are lots of different kinds of processes. But uh, for example, my dad was doing my, my you know my father and my mother are are out now, but you know for my whole childhood they were in just like I was. Um, my dad was an auditor, and he thought it was the greatest thing ever, right? And he was auditing some guy one time. He tells me this story. And the guy just, uh, when you're on the e-meter, you're holding these tin cans, right? You have these, these, these uh, tin plated cans in your hands. And he threw the cans down. He was being asked morally relevant, morally compromising questions, questions of a confessional nature. Have you ever, you know, done bad things, right? Just cheated on your wife, stolen money from your office, these kind of questions. He was being, he was in a confessional se uh, session threw the cans down, stood up, walked over to the window, was like, fuck, I'm not doing this anymore. You can't make me, I'm done, right? Just stood there. And my dad just sat at the desk and looked up at him and said, well, all right, you know, it'd be really good if you know, let's get you back on this thing. Come on, let's do this. Let's do this, right? Trying to encourage him and the guy wouldn't do it, wouldn't do it, wouldn't do it. And my dad finally said, well, look, it's your dime. I mean, you're being charged by the hour for this and I got all day. <laughs> so... <laughs> Let's get to it, right? And the guy, that's what finally got the guy leveraged back into the chair because my dad was not going to let that guy out of the room. But but I guess my question is, is do these auditors, and you've been in that position, I presume yourself, uh, you're a former auditor, is that right? So Auditor um, and pre-clear. Yeah. yeah, so do are these auditors doing this and trying to get success out of their pre-clears in a desire to do good for them or yes. in, 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 or for a desire to get them into the organization, even if they don't necessarily realize it's a financial thing or whatever, you know, is, is it, is it, I want to do good or is it, I need them in. Do you know what I mean? Well, they're cult members, right? So everybody, everybody who's in a cult wants everybody else in the world to be part of their cult. I mean, when you believe you have truth with a capital T on your side and the, and the, the, you know, the, 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 one of the prime characteristics of a cult is us versus them. We're yeah. the good guys. Everybody else is the bad guys. Right. Yeah. So if you're not with us, you're against us kind of thing. Yeah. Now Scientology doesn't necessarily think that way about the outside world, but they do think that everybody, everybody needs to be a Scientologist or this world's going to, you know, die a gruesome, horrible, awful death. Hubbard convinces people of that over and over and over again in his writings. Not so true. every Scientologist is very, very keen on making more Scientologists. Um, the auditors especially are trained in such a way that they believe that what they are doing is the only 
actual form of mental health counseling or therapy that works. Right. So they genuinely believe that. Yeah. Yeah. They genuinely believe that. I mean, my father wasn't doing it for the money. You know, he really believed he was helping people. I really believed I was helping people. That's why I stuck with it for so long. Um, But we weren't. We were hurting people. You know, the auditing process, the entire framework of it is a coercively controlling framework. It compromises you and forces you to be part of the process until they say you're done. There is no way under any format that that is good mental health therapy. But that's what they claim it is. And I think I've heard you talk before about, so I was talking about how you end up getting involved in the organization. You end up paying money, but also paying in terms of time. I think it was yourself that was talking about how much of a life you didn't have outside of Scientology because you were literally doing Scientology all the time. It was like a huge drain on your energy and time. Do you want to speak to that? Sure, absolutely. I mean, especially once I joined staff, I was pretty hardcore. I was working for eight years in Santa Barbara. I worked basically 80 hour weeks because I was working 40 hours, 50 hours, sometimes 60 hours a week at the church, which, by the way, I was being paid about 10 to 15 bucks a week because it was a volunteer status. So I was not able to support myself. So I had to have an outside of Scientology job, a real job. And I had a series of them because Scientology kept interfering with my outside life. And I was in a headspace where I believe Scientology was, you know, the senior thing. And, uh, and I needed to always, always be on board with Scientology. Uh, so, um, I worked a lot. I worked all the time. The only time I really wasn't working was like, you know, Saturday and Sunday nights when I got to do my laundry and stuff, right? So finally, by the time I was 25 years old, I was like, okay, well, this isn't really working. I'm working my ass off, but we're really not getting anywhere. Why don't I join the C organization? I, I stupidly double down. <laughs> so in for a penny, in for a pound. That's right. You know, because I was still very much in the headspace. I had not, this is all, you know, I joined the Sea Org in 1995. There was no internet. There were no mm. resources for me to go to, to find out what I was actually involved in. Uh, and I was going to speak to that uh, yeah. earlier yeah. When, when talking about the decrease in, in membership. Yeah. If you like, that that's going to be a lot to do with the internet, I'm sure, and the fact that yeah. the information is so easily available. But imagine yourself in the, in those mid '90s, then you just uh-huh. there, the opportunity to break out uh, is so much truncated by by the lack of internet. I mean, we take it for granted, don't we? Well, we very much do now. I, you know, I'm sure you and I remember what it was like before. If you wanted to know something, if you didn't have a set of encyclopedias at home, <laughs> you know, you had to go down to the library. That was how it worked. You didn't just pick up your phone. There was no phone. Your phone was a thing that was on the wall, you know? So, uh, yeah, so we didn't have any of that. And I was a library hound, by the way. I was a voracious reader as a child. I was I was pretty literate uh, and, and, and read, but I hadn't read any negative critical stuff about Scientology because that's verboten. That's another aspect of cult control is... When you're in a group that will con- will actively control the information that is available to you and will punish you for going outside of their rules on that, that's culty. And that's what that's yeah. absolutely what Scientology does, is they train you into self-policing, not reading anything bad about Scientology, because all those guys are the liars. And we have the truth. And if you want to know about Scientology, just come ask. We'll tell you all about it. Sure, we'll tell you what we think we know about it, but we're not telling you the whole truth about it because we didn't know. You know, and that was, but it was, it was easy for us to sell ourselves on the idea that we did because I was hardcore. I was doing Scientology 24 7, both as a staff member and then as a Sea Org member from 1995 to 2012. So for those periods of time, I was steeped in the Scientology lore and mythology and organization and belief set. And I couldn't imagine that anybody else could think that this was bad or horrible or wrong 
until the abuse is piled on so high that it was just undeniable at that point. So, so your root out of this, and we again, we have we're, this will bring us on to fair gaming. Yeah. Uh, your root out of how did you start doubting? What 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 triggered that? You know. Well, there were a number of things. The The truth about my leaving is that it was about a 10-year process. And I, I sort of jokingly tell people I'm a slow learner, right? Because <laughs> it took me a long time for those beliefs to wear down. And I, I, I attribute a lot of that to the fact that I was second gen, right? So being raised with it. It's, it's powerful stuff. And, and those euphoric experiences, although they became fewer and farther between, can be quite powerful. And you only need a couple a year to keep it up, to keep the belief up, even though you're being abused physically, mentally, right, psychologically. There was tons and tons of physical abuse. I was assaulted in the Sea Org. I was in a prison system in the Sea Org for three years doing hard physical labor. I mean, I was basically what, human how come? Trafficked, labor trafficked. How come? Well, how did that happen? Oh, it's a, it's kind of a, we can get into that, but it might uh, distract a little bit from where we're, yeah. where we're going right now. Um, I'm just trying to say that, that, that there's a, I, I've, been, I've really, I, I've focused so much on the abusive aspects of the auditing process that I, I, I failed to kind of paint the picture here that, the entire world of Scientology, the bubble world that, that is Scientology, the culture, if you will, is, a, is, is layers upon layers of abuse. A lot of it very subtle, some of it not so subtle. Like I said, I was assaulted in the sewer physically. I was slapped around, beaten up. Um, I, again, hard physical labor for three years, uh, for 12 hours a day. I mean, that's, it was rough. That was a rough, rough time period for me. Um, I, you know, but I got, I got through it because I believed that what I was doing was the right thing to do. And I believed, you know, that, that L. Ron Hubbard had a point and that he knew what he was talking about. And it, it's taken me 10 years out of Scientology to get over all of that and recover from that. And a lot of education. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, like I said, just layers upon layers of abuse from physical to psychological to spiritual. And mm -hmm. Yeah. Was it a case of getting to a tipping point then? Were you just finding, okay, that's a problem. I'm just going to compartmentalize that for a yeah. bit and then go on a little bit further. That's a problem. Okay, put that in there. That's and eventually right. you've got this collection of problems. You're like, yeah, this is, you know, the cost benefit analysis of, of what I'm doing has now reached a point where it's obvious that this is more of a cost than a benefit. Is you that, is that what happened? You got it. They're basically, the way I put it with people now from, from, from how I see things now is, in order to split from, you know, um, an, an abusive situation, certainly, although this could be applied to more than just abusive situations, whether it's a, let's say you're in a relationship with a narcissist, or you're in a destructive cult of some kind or something like that, right? The kind of situation where you have been sold on the goodness and, and, and wonderfulness of the situation. And your doubts and your fears and your reservations about it, even in the face of flat out abuse, you reframe in your mind as, oh, well, yeah, I see him hitting this other person, but he, that guy kind of deserved it. You know, you have to reframe it. It's that cognitive dissonance. That's like cognitive dissonance reduction. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You have to reframe it to make it make sense. Otherwise, it, it doesn't make any sense. And you start questioning, what am I doing here? And you can't do that. Because look at all this, you know, look at all this goodness I've gotten from it. Look at all this wonderful positivity that's that's come from this, right? So what you do is you reframe and you constantly are reframing bad things as good when you're in a situation like this until at some point there will be an unforgivable moral transgression that cannot be denied. You can't deny it, right? Um you know, it could be that you are demanded to separate from your family. It could be that you are required to do something illegal. It could be that somebody hits you. It could be any number of things because it's very highly individual for each person. It depends a great deal upon an individual's own sense of right and wrong, their morality. But once an unforgivable moral transgression has occurred, that's when that's what we call a nail in the coffin. And, a, and one or a series of those, and for me, it took a series of them, 
I including three years of hard physical labor because <laughs> I, I yeah. guess I'm a slow learner. Um, I finally twigged on it, right? And by 2011, um, I was like, you know, something, mm, something's not right here. And the final straw for me, because there was an, a long series of them, but the final one was the day that it really hit me out of the blue. Like all of a sudden, I, the, 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 the sort of the curtains parted and I was able to kind of see the truth of it. It and was the uh, Wizard of Oz. Uh, yeah, exactly. And, and, and quite literally, that's what it felt like because mm -hmm. I was, was suddenly, it became crystal clear that my day-to-day -day operations as a Scientologist, as a Sea Org member, involved having to lie to people more than I was telling the truth. Wow, it was yeah. the ratio was all out of whack. And I had compromised my own integrity and my own honor for these lies because I thought this was the right thing. And you know, you all you always have your reasons. And at the moment, mm -hmm. in the moment of it, they're very good reasons. They make a lot of sense to you, right? But then typical, so typical religious reasoning, which is for the greater good, right? I'm, right. you know, very I, much I, for the greater good. Very yeah. much for that. Because I already recognized by then that I had been martyring myself, that I had been, you know, really allowing some really not okay things to be happening to me in service of the greater good. I, you know, that all that dedication, all those years of sacrifice and work on my part were heartfelt. They were, they were, I was honest work being done by somebody who truly thought that because I was doing this work, I was directly contributing to making the whole world better. Hmm. And that's heady. That is that, you know, you want to talk about some awe inducing stuff, right? Yeah. When you, when you think you are Luke Skywalker, when you think you're a Jedi Knight, right? And that was kind of, I'm analogizing. We didn't talk about ourselves that way, but when you think that way about yourself, then you're willing to endure all kinds of crap for the greater good. And yeah. that was what I had been doing until the day I finally realized, wait a minute, that's not what I'm doing at all. I'm telling lies to people and, and calling this a good thing. It's not a good thing. I can't be doing this anymore. And that's when I started. Which up. then which then brings us on to idiosyncrasy's uh, question here. How, is it, how easy is it, is it to leave and did it have enforcement to stop you? And of course, the fair gaming thing uh, in... in you know, and, and the techniques you use in the UK, I, this is probably isn't so famous in, in the US, but you will know of it, which is um, the, uh, oh, what's his name? John Sweeney, the BBC uh, oh, yeah. correspondent who did uh, a very famous BBC documentary on Scientology. And he got followed and followed and, and they got to him and he ev eventually had this outburst of screaming in one of the guy's faces who was following him, who were fair gaming him. And so, uh, and this is really famous on British TV, but probably less so out there. But it's a great bit of TV that, that really got you to sympathize with John Sweeney and to, to really understand the kind of pressures that, the, that they were put on you. And other documentaries where, you know, it's all about following people with, with their own kind of film crew and stuff like this That's you right. know, filming the film crews and all this but um so this is all fair gaming so how how easy or difficult was it for you to leave and what was a fair game can you explain fair gaming and how that affected you yeah absolutely and it's funny because i just uh googled it real fast there's a whole wikipedia page on fair game yeah I mean, it's it's quite a thing it's a very it, it's basically scientology dirty tricks used yeah. or leveraged against their critics or ex-members who are speaking out about the truth of what they experienced hubbard labeled such critics fair game which means in his writings that they are no longer as ex-members or as suppressive people or an SP. That's a very common term in Scientology for an antisocial or anti-Scientology person. And notice that they equate those two things. If you're against Scientology, you're anti-social. Uh, you know, just the wordplay of cults, loaded language of cults, yeah. is, and Scientology is steeped in loaded language. There's dictionaries this thick in Scientology uh, redefining uh, terms. 
So fair game is one of those terms where Hubbard said, okay, you are an ex member, you're a critic, you're a bad person, we're going to label you fair game, which means we get to do anything we want to you can be lied to sued, harassed, murdered. We're not going to punish any Scientologists who do any of that to you because you deserve it because you're antisocial. And once they've labeled you that, Scientology can come after you, and they do. Now, this was uh, used to, you know, used to be a bit more intense than it is, excuse me, now for most people. However, they still do all this stuff. It's just so focused now, right? They they sort of reserve this stuff for their bitterest, harshest enemies now, like Leah Remini or people who bring court cases against them are routinely fair gamed. So are- Leah Remini, for those who don't know, is, is an actress in the States who, who was a Scientologist who came out and has very famously been uh, attacked for that, but but has been really outspoken and and provided a channel for other people to be outspoken as well. That's right. That's right. And in, in fact, a, a channel for me, I was, I got to, uh, be on our show twice, (laughs) the Scientology in the Aftermath series, right? Which which was an Emmy award-winning documentary. It was awesome being part of that. So the fair gaming is, you know, they go after critics who have sort of attained a a high enough public level that they feel threatened by this person, that the church actually is like, oh, this guy could harm us. And then they go after them. And Hubbard back in his day when he was alive, would go after anybody who even breathed a harsh word about Scientology in a public venue. Now they really reserve it for the heavy, the heavy hitters. I, being on Leah's show, for example, there's a hate website on me. Uh, as part of their fair gaming of Leah, they fair game me. Hmm. Now, it's just a website. It really didn't do a whole lot. It wasn't like they were sitting outside my door stalking me, at least not that I know of. But they do that to Leah. They do that to Mike Rinder, who was her partner on that documentary. They've done that to Alex Gibney, who who made the Scientology, the Going Clear documentary. Yeah, which is really good. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's amazing. If you only have two hours to know, to find out about Scientology, that's the documentary to watch. And also, also watch his documentary, um, Mayor Maxima Culpa, about the um, deaf uh, school of... Um, uh, to do with the Catholic Church in the Boston area and oh, sure. uh, in Massachusetts, uh, which uh, yeah, so Mayor Maxima Culpa is Alex. I think he got a, a, an Oscar for that, but is absolutely amazing. But anyway, sorry, I don't. No, no, no worries, no worries. So, so this fair gaming, I, I you know, I'm I'm not trying to downplay it. I'm just trying to say it's a little bit more focused now. The dirty tricks are the dirty tricks. It, you know, they they have they have <laughs> what. One thing to keep in mind about the Church of Scientology that maybe we should never, ever forget and maybe lead with when it comes to fair gaming is they fair game the United States government, the Canadian government, the UK government. In the 1970s, they were raided by the FBI in 1977 because the Church of Scientology engaged in the most pervasive, largest criminal conspiracy and infiltration of the United States government than anyone has ever been able to pull off. Scientology pulled wow. that off because wow. they have an intelligence operation as one of the divisions of their church. It's called the Office of Special Affairs. It's an intelligence operation and a dirty tricks operation. And back in the 70s, it was called the Guardian's Office. They got busted by the FBI in 1977. Eleven Scientologists went to jail, including L. Ron Hubbard's wife. And the only reason Hubbard didn't go to jail is because he was hiding from the law for the rest of his life until he died in 86. He was an unindicted co-conspirator because they couldn't get their hands on him. And uh, ever and then they had to change the name of the Guardian's office to the Office of Special Affairs. Same people doing the same dirty tricks, but they changed the name, right? And so that's how they kind of get away with uh, continuing these operations. And Hubbard's policies about intelligence and counterintelligence and, and fair gaming critics are crystal clear. And from even he even wrote it, you know, preceding all this all the way back to 1955, Hubbard was writing that with critics of Scientology, you are to use legal and illegal means 
and use lawsuits as threats, as harassment, use the courts to harass people because Scientology has all the money in the world to bring as many which, cases. Which they did to the IRS as well, didn't they? They didn't did. They? Yeah. they did. They fair game the IRS. You bet they did through the 1980s. And that's how they actually got the IRS worn out to the point that the IRS said, okay, we're done. Enough. We'll give you your tax exemption back. That's how they did I it. And the other thing they do, uh, as far as I understand, or I, I bet they do, uh, partly to do with the auditing process and the fact that so many uh, people going through that are going to be you know, confessing X, Y, and Z. So in the UK, in politics, we have the whips. So the whips are, the chief whips are on both parties are the people that go around getting their own party members, like Conservative Party, they'll have the chief Tory whips who will whip their party members into voting for how they want to vote. They don't want anyone to vote against this particular policy. Or So they'll, they'll go around and say, you've got to vote, you've got to vote, you've got to vote. And if any, for example, Tory politician says, oh, I'm not going to vote for that because I don't believe in it, then they say, they have a little black book, which is that they have all the dirt on all the different MPs. And that dirt goes into the chief whips books and they'll use that as leverage to get the, the votes they want. Both mm -hmm. parties will do this, but the Tories are well renowned for this in the UK. There's some interesting documentaries uh, that show how explicit this is. And they yeah. really do just, just go to town and like, oh, right. So you like little boys. Okay, right. We'll be using that. Uh, and all this. So they will not tell, tell, uh, you know, the authorities that actually here's a paedophile MP know which would be the right thing to do. They keep that as leverage. So um, which is interesting. So documented. Yeah, yeah. So there, there, there's a really interesting documentary from the 90s that's got some really interesting. Uh, I'll, I'll send you a clip, a clip on it yeah. at, at some point. But the really interesting admissions by senior Tory politicians that yeah, the little black book exists, and you know we use it to to make sure people vote in the that way is we want. So culty. It, so it is so culty. It is operate. Oh, it's fascinating. Actually, it might be really interesting for you to watch that if, in uh -huh. your own research. Yeah, yeah, I will yeah, send absolutely. that to you. Um, but uh, but but I imagine that's exactly the sort of thing that goes on with the Sea Org or with within within the organization of science. If they need to, yeah. If they need to, they absolutely will either threaten you with exposure. But more often than not, by the time you're a critic speaking out publicly, you've already separated from the church, so they just use it. Yeah. They take whatever secrets you gave them, because let's keep in mind, these auditing sessions are, are there. you get lots of them. I've had thousands of hours of Scientology auditing. It's not like you do it every now and again. It's it, There's a lot to do. And in the course of that are these confessionals I mentioned, or what they call security checks. And they will security check you against, you know, immoral acts that you have committed in your past. And they write it all down. They even video it now. And they have it all on file. They have stacks and stacks. They have warehouses full of folders of secrets people have divulged to the Church of Scientology in the auditing, thinking that it's confidential, that nobody's ever going to see this. <laughs> until you turn traitor on them, and then they will unleash that on the world. And not only will they release your secrets, they'll spice it up. They'll make it out to be the worst possible thing you've ever done in your entire life. My hate webpage is an example of that, right? I'll, I'll give you a, a, an example. I'll just tell you straight up. They call me a deadbeat dad. Well, I had a son, and he uh, couldn't be with him and his mother because I was working for the church and they wouldn't let me go. And I thought saving the world, greatest good, that's the thing I should do. And so I stuck with the church and I was loyal to the church and I stayed with the church, even though I was making $25 a week. There was no way, there was no world where I was going to be a Scientology staff member and pay child support. Those two things could not go together. And in my deluded, brainwashed state, I chose Scientology over my own potential family. That's really harsh. That's, that's not, not really yeah. cool of me, right? Yeah. So years later, once I'm disloyal to the church, see, at the time, nobody had anything to say about that. They were like, oh, yeah, good on you, Chris, for staying in Scientology and, doing the, and fighting the good fight and saving the world. Clever. And the day I left and showed up on Leah's show, 
I'm suddenly a deadbeat dad who never paid any child support. Well, whose fault was that? All mine? I don't think so. But they don't tell you any of that part. They just called me a deadbeat dad who never paid any child support. You see the twist. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I bet, goodness me, I bet they've got a load on people like Tom Cruise, you know, who... who oh, sure. Who, they who, don't who, even have to have that with Tom Cruise because Tom Cruise is a fucking fanatic. Yeah, yeah. They well, never I, blackmail Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise is Tom Cruise is his own level of of asshole. I, I have very harsh words about Tom Cruise. Yes, evidently. Uh, well, actually, <laughs> yeah, actually, and I know this is a mandatory subject for any kind yeah. of talk on Scientology because everyone goes straight to Tom Cruise. Yeah, but uh, but uh, so I'm sorry for that. But no. actually, so what are what are your your very quick sort of synopsis on Tom Cruise? What have you, did you ever get to come across him cross paths? I, um, I was is he, is he as men- <laughs> sorry. Sorry? I'm always five minutes away from him. There were three times where Tom Cruise was kind of in my vicinity, but I was always, you know, I'd rush over to try to see him. This is when I was still in Scientology and I would have just missed him. Right. Kind of thing. Yeah. So I never did meet Tom Cruise. I met John Travolta. I met Kelly. I met, I met some other people. Um, John Travolta, by the way, is a super nice guy. I mean, totally deluded, but he's actually legit a nice guy. I don't yeah. care about his sexual proclivities. I never did. Um, you know, I I, I I happen to think he's probably a bisexual or something because yeah. I, I know he loves his family and I know he loved his wife. But um, but well, yeah. there's a story about his son dying as well. Which oh, yeah. Is- yeah. Yeah. Jet. Yeah. yeah. Jet died. It's tragic. It was very it was a tragic loss. And Scientology didn't help that at all. Scientology is rapidly anti-medicine in many ways, anti-hospital, anti-doctor. So um, John Travolta's son probably, you know, who, who could say for sure, but he wasn't helped by the Scientology influence. I will certainly say that. As far as Tom Cruise goes, he's, de- he's, de- he's best friends with David Miscavige, the current leader of Scientology, has been for years, actually for about the last 20 years, they've, at 20, 25 years, they've been like best buds. And um, Miscavige, is, was, Miscavige was Tom Cruise's best man, for example. Exactly. At his wedding, right, to um, Katie Holmes. So um, Tom, t- and you can find this documented all over the Internet. This is not just, you know, some rumor. Tom takes gross advantage of the Sea Org members who are already being labor trafficked, mind you, right? The Sea Org is just a labor trafficking organization. And Tom Cruise takes personal advantage of that. He had his airplane hangar, his home restored fully uh, his SUV, his motorcycles. The Sea Org did a ton of free work on all of those properties. Has nothing to do with Scientology or its mission. It's just Tom Cruise. So anything that's going to help Tom Cruise is going to help Scientology. So Sea Org members were forced to work day and night, you know, for no pay whatsoever. Uh, Sea Org pay, by the way, is like 50 bucks a week. Still is to this day. So, which um, might, might go some way to answering this question, which is do auditors get remunerated or is it voluntary? You've kind of answered that. Uh, do second gen members have extra kudos in the organization? No, second gen members do not have extra kudos. However, a bunch of the recruits these days are pretty much second gen members because there's no new members coming in. Right. So they have to kind of cannibalize their, fa- you know, the existing Scientology families Mm-hmm. to get you know to get new sea org members and stuff but that's why they're shrinking so hard is because new membership is just dried up mm-hmm. there's nobody coming in i but, mean uh, compared, to the, compared to the 70s when it was just you couldn't keep the i mean that just people were flooding in it was you couldn't you couldn't stop it does now, tom cruise does tom cruise act as a, a pr member still or is that well is it- you haven't really seen much have you right not in quite a while because his career was like this close to being kind of ruined when he started proselytizing Scientology in a public forum, Oprah and Matt Lauer, that, that, that horrible interview where he, where he uh, kind of threw shade at Brooke Shields for her psychiatric uh, history and um, for, you know, you don't know the history of psychiatry like I do. You're just glib. I mean, Tom Cruise was just being a complete dickhead right on camera. You know, and that's because yeah. that's who he really is. See, people yeah. don't get that about Tom Cruise. Is those interviews when he's jumping around on the couch acting like a nut? That's who he is. Yeah. It's just that he almost lost everything 
because Paramount and his publicist and various other people were just like, dude, you need to tone it down. People are laughing at you. And yeah, he, when that when that leaked oh, video was him. Know. And they kind of had to force him back on the ground and like put a muzzle on him. And now, if you try to ask Tom Cruise anything about Scientology, he will shut you down. And and he won't allow interviewers to ask him anything about it. He is a complete coward on the topic now. I recently wrote an article on on Tom Cruise and Scientology for Only Sky uh, Media um, uh, organization I write for, cool. and uh, it was about you know why why did the media give Tom Cruise such a easy time, considering you know everyone pretty much recognizes that he's part of Scientology and it's a bit crazy. And uh, and there's lots going on there, lots of cognitive dissonance in people's own minds with regard to, hey, I like him as an actor. I like his movies, for example, for many people. Um, uh, and so I can compartmentalize that or this or that or whatever. That's right. Um, but, but actually, the media don't challenge him as well, because I think he kind of dictates how the uh, the. Um, because of course he's got production companies, I presume. So you know, if you, if you piss him off in a in a, in a in an interview, he won't book. He won't allow you to book certain people. I, I get I get the idea that things like that go on, and so right. you know, it's all very carefully curated. Exactly. I will say this to your audience, and this might, for in my mind, this is my opinion. Okay. And I am not by making this comparison. I'm not calling Tom Cruise a child molester. I don't think that's what his thing is. He's an abusive person to his family and to, and to Sea Org members and Scientologists around him. Very abusive. And, and he's just so full of himself. People would have no idea. But the actual abuses that he carries out against Scientologists in private where nobody else can see... I believe is on the order of Jimmy Seville. Right. I think when it comes out, what Tom Cruise actually gets up to in private, and eventually, hopefully, that will come out, people will be just as shocked as they were about Jimmy. And just to clarify, so Jimmy Savile was a BBC um, TV presenter or just the television in general in the UK was a bit of a house, was a huge household name in the 70s and 80s. I never liked him, actually. But, but anyway, that's by the by. But he was hugely popular and it allowed him to get away with doing loads of moral evils, including, you know, sexual abuse of minors and all sorts. And then this all came out pretty much around his death or, or was just coming out before. But it, a lot of it is buried. People never really looked into it. And he, he just got away with loads of stuff and i can see what you're saying now i can see the similarities which being in a person that everyone looks up to that everyone likes you in, in the public light you are able to get away with with treating other people absolutely terribly uh, so that's a really interesting uh like um you know similarity there um so so I mean, I, there's that leaked video that came out of of Tom Cruise uh, that that was a, a proper um, Scientology video that was uh, part of yeah, their um, yes, the turtleneck video. Yeah, where he's just going nuts in that chair, just yes. like nuts, as in like so into it, and then and the people have edited over the Mission Impossible theme yeah. tune to make it even. Oh no, worse. that Mission Impossible theme was in the event. Oh, was, was it was right? There. Okay. Yeah, yeah, they they were playing that music as part of the presentation. It's because, it, I mean, that, watching that, that is when I was like, oh, my goodness, Tom Cruise is an absolute Fruit Loop. And, yeah. uh, you know, e end of respect for this man. He's lost the plot. I'm a skeptic. And this is nuts. And, right. yeah. Yeah, he is. He he claimed, amongst many other insane things in that video, that Scientology has cornered the market on mental health and therapy. And at an accident site, Scientologists are the only ones who can actually do any good. He just completely degrades any first responders, any people, EMTs, nurses, doctors, uh, firefighters, all, just cast them all, just threw them all under the bus compared to what Scientologists can do. I mean, it's just insane the stuff he was saying in that video. So, and, and do you, um, I mean, you know, when you, when you kind of, cast your opinion about what's going on in Scientology and, and the fact that, say, for example, Tom Cruise has got up to, uh, you know, no good. 
is 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 are you are you still speaking to people in Scientology? Um, do you just know a lot of people who have come out of Scientology who are telling you these things? You know, what, what how's your relationship with people still in there? Oh, yeah, I have no relationship with people still in. <laughs> I'm a suppressive person. I have been declared persona non grata by the Church of Scientology. So any Scientologist who is found out to be communicating with me is going to join me as a suppressive person. They, they kick you out. And, they, and once you're kicked out, you are subject to fair game. And those threats are real. And people kind of know that. So they don't know. But here's the crazy thing. When you're in the bubble world you actually don't know all the fair game stuff. You don't know all the stuff the church is doing. They hide all that even from their own membership. Really? Oh yeah, you don't know about all the dirty tricks and the driving people to suicide. You hear various things and you think to yourself as a Scientologist, good, I'm glad that that awful suppressive person got their just rewards because it's all framed to you that they're the bad guy and we're the good guys. It's us versus them dialed up to 11, right? An, like, attack, on the, uh, an attack on the organization is an attack on you. Exactly. And so somebody who's out there speaking harshly about Scientology deserves anything they get, right? And so, um, so it's absolutely verboten that you be a Scientologist in good standing and have any communication with us anti-social, anti-Scientology SPs. However, and this is really good news, actually. Lately, the church has been collapsing so hard and has been issuing such authoritarian nonsense on its own membership through the whole COVID debacle that they that its membership is, is shrunk drastically and members who are still in have actually been reaching out to me because they've seen some of my video work or they saw the aftermath or they saw going clear. They heard my name and they email me or they contact me and we start a dialogue. And this is just, you know, individuals who are in the church who are on the fence, don't know what to think, still in the headspace, but not quite sure something's wrong, but I don't know what. And they contact me and I help them out. And I've done that a couple of times and, or I've assisted in that activity. I can't take full credit for it because it's really up to the person to get themselves out for yeah. real. It's not my job to do that. It's their job. I just try to show them the door. But that's been happening lately. And that is new because in 10 years of about 10 years now of doing this, um, you know, this is a real sign of, of serious cracks in that dam that they're reaching out to us SPs now from inside the church, wondering what the hell's going on. So that's been a pretty recent thing, and I'm heavily encouraged by that. That's really good. Um, so when when you were a member or, or when you speak to other members, when when they look up to to David Miscavige and Tom Cruise, I mean, what what, what do they think about them? Are, they, are, they, are, they, are these like the shining stars? God's on earth. God's on earth. They're like, oh, you know. Now, it's interesting because I had to sort of think deeply about the kind of feelings and emotions that would come up in me when David Miscavige was around. When I was in the Sea Org, David Miscavige is a figure that inspires terror and really? a great deal of fear, right? Because he has the power of almost life and death. I mean, he can, that labor program I was telling you about, it's called the Rehabilitation Project Force. Because of all the exposure we've been doing, they canceled it. They don't do that anymore, which is pretty cool. Um, but we did that, right? We, we they, they were kind of forced to change internally because of all the exposure. Um, but there's lots of other punishments and lots of other things. Believe me, it's not a kinder, gentler Scientology. It's just trying to look like that. Anyway, he has the power to verbally just order you to that, you know, to those kinds of things. You know, it's like, oh, go, go dig 15 ditches and tell me when you're done. You know, I mean, he could do that easily to any Sea Org member anytime he wants. He has, you know, kind of power of life and death at his command. So when he's around, people are like, you know, uh, standard attention, you know. Oh, I didn't mention the C organization is paramilitary. They have uniforms and ranks and ratings and yes, sir, no, sir, how high, sir, and marching and close order drilling and 
they they act kind of wow. like little military outfits. So for those 17 years I was a Sea Org member, I was in a uniform and I was marching around like I was somebody, you know, so that kind of thing. Wow, and there must be playing on so many different like psychologies going on there, and the, oh, the feeling of power. Oh. When you get, when you look back uh, to Philip Zimbardo's um, Stanford Prison Experiment, yeah. uh, you know back where he got. For those who don't know, this is back I think in the seventies, where in the post kind of the Stanley Milgram like post. Uh, still trying to work out why Nazis could, you know, normal people could do terrible things in the Second yeah. World War. Uh, he got his uh, uh, psychology faculty. Uh, he randomly split them in between into like guards and prisoners and then did a fake sort of prison set up. And then they had to uh, cancel it after three days because everyone was going mental. And then the prisoners, the, the right. guards, were, guards were acting like, you know, excessively like um, authoritarian guards and treating their actual mates who are, who are like psychology students who are just pretend prisoners really terribly uh so the idea is you know you can dress up and you can feel like this and suddenly it's very easy to just slip into that kind of like thought process and, that's right and and I, I have personal experience of that you know people people criticize that um the Stanford prison experiment for a, for a great number of things some legit some not but when people say oh that's all bullshit people wouldn't act that way I'm sorry I've lived it and people do act that way. And if you don't have a life experience of having lived through something like that, you don't get to just brush that off and say, people don't do that. Yeah, they do. And yeah. I did it. I was an abuser. I was an abusee. Everybody in a cult is, is an abuser and abusee. And that's one of the problems and difficulties with dealing with cults on a moral level is it's not all black and white. There are so many shades of gray in it when it comes to the morality of it. But everybody who's involved is ultimately the subject of <sighs> tremendously powerful mechanisms of thought reform and control. And people are not really as strong as they like to think they are. And people are not anywhere near as smart as they think they are. <laughs> and I'm including myself at the top of that list. And they are able to be deceived and able to be controlled very easily. And this is one of the ways that cults happen. And, it's, and it happens because people don't know how susceptible they are to them. Yeah. Which goes back to your like wanting to concentrate on critical thinking to That's try right. and at least give people the tools to be able to deal with. So as we move towards sort of wrapping this up, if anyone has any questions, please do get them in. Any super chats would be hugely um, appreciated, but obviously only if you can. Um, uh, so how I, I'm interested in, you know, obviously this might be sensitive ground, but you said you have been on the wrong side of, you know, abusing others, of, 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 sure. of, of, of of treating other people badly how have you dealt with that and um you know you said that it's taken you 10 years to kind of come to terms with this is this still an ongoing battle or have you made peace with yourself uh and how you know how do you help others maybe in, in similar situations sure sure well as you noted um you know in terms of helping others you um you, you know there's a lot of content on my channel yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, yeah. I've, been a, I've been a very hard worker in the last yeah. 10 years. As well, far, you've done three years in labor camp, so, you know. Yeah, yeah, so getting, the, getting the word out about this stuff. And I have long since passed the point where I feel I have made up for, you know, any damage that I have done right, as a psychologist, right? right? Um, I, I mean, I've dedicated my life to this work. This isn't just some random interview we're doing. I, I do this all mm. the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this is literally my job, right? Mm. Um. As far as as far as taking responsibility for the things that I did, though, uh, shortly after I got out and got on social media and started kind of hooking up with other ex members and kind of getting into that community, I started reaching out to and apologizing to people that I had harmed who I could be in touch with because I can't reach out to people who are in the church. They don't want to hear from me, but people who are out. Hey man, I am so sorry I did this or this or this or this or this. And so far that's gone over pretty well. Um, you know, not everybody is down with that. And some people are just not in a forgiving mood. And I can't really do anything about that except be here and do the best that I can to to say, look, I I I, I did horrible 
things. Now, those horrible things for me are not anywhere near the kind of crap, you know, Miscavige or Cruz or the heavy hitters are pulling. I, I yelled at some people. I was part of disciplinary actions. I, I definitely did contribute to a couple times to, um, or enabled the, you know, the separation of families and stuff like that, like stuff I, I'm not at all happy about. And I don't, and I don't mean to downplay it. It was, it was awful and I shouldn't have done it. But I was in a headspace where I believed I was doing good, not bad. And I was convinced that I was doing good. That's how, that's how weirdly twisted the whole thing gets. So once I kind of flipped the script on myself on that, I did try to reach out and, and, you know, make up for in somehow to the individuals that I could find. Otherwise, I've been producing the content I've been producing and trying very hard to show people what happens in destructive cults, not just Scientology, but all of them, because they're really all, they all go by the same playbook. And there really is, you could write down on a piece of paper, the number of tricks that they use. I mean, there really aren't that many. It's a, it's a short list. It's just the variations are where yeah. they become, you know, so incredibly wild, you know, in, in terms of how you can mix it up. But the actual techniques, just a few. I, I guess the, one of the most important ones, and you've touched on this separation of family, but, but if you are absent of of the closest people in your life friends and family or the all the people that are going to support you in any time of difficulty if you are either spending so long because you're working for and with scientologists at, at their institutions that you're away from friends and family or you just don't have friends because you've been inculcated into this cult uh then you just don't have those mechanisms to to give you a lifeline out of there it's just exactly, in. exactly. and that's why i i highlighted at the very beginning right the three manifestations or or steps of coercive control right isolation manipulation and control you can't, you can't get to the control part until you isolate and manipulate. Right. The person. right. And that's, that's where it becomes coercive. Right. So, so that's what they specialize in and you can isolate an individual, but you can also isolate a community. And, and that's that bubble world aspect that we talk about. And they isolate people through us versus them, black and white thinking, chanting mantras, mind inducing, you know, trance inducing techniques, um, convincing people that the leader is the greatest person who ever lived and that we have a corner on the truth and nobody else does. So we have the sacred knowledge or what's called sacred science. And on top of that, uh, those more obvious things are all these very subtle mechanisms like loaded language where you redefine words and sometimes in, in subtle ways and sometimes in not so subtle ways and when you control a person's vocabulary, you control how they think, not just what they think. That's really interesting. Those really subtle ways of getting inside mm -hmm. people's minds by, lang mm -hmm. yeah, language is, yeah, it's an insidious mechanism. Um, exactly. J James here is a, um, a former Jehovah's Witness and talking about, I mean, we've had, I've had a Jehovah's Witness show before where James uh, came on with, an, with another uh, guest and talked and he's still, obviously, you know, has elements of being, of getting over that JW cult. And, and it was really interesting going through that, seeing how cultish, you know, J Jehovah's Witness was. I mean, I didn't know an, uh, much about Jehovah's Witness, but it seems oh, to me very much. Full on destructive cult. J JWs are as bad as Scientology. It's yeah. Awful. It's awful yeah. And so he's saying religions or cults weaponize us by making us think that abusive behavior is counted as loving, which is That's exactly right. what, what you were saying. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, and just we sort of uh, amble towards the end. Um, those elements of euphoria and you were saying that as as this went on in your time in in uh in scientology that they got fewer and further between but those those times of complete euphoria obviously were really important for keeping you there a yes. couple of questions on this which is one do you miss having them or do you still actually are you able to obtain those in a non-scientology kind of way or you know using those techniques do you do you yearn for those euphoric moments i do not yearn for them certainly not in the same way that i did when i was in scientology it is an addiction by the way and it's and it can be classified i believe that way that's 
my take on it. I believe yeah. the, the, the neurochemicals and the and the, the or sorry the neurotransmitters and chemicals that are involved are same same as what you see in you know other addictions, and you're constantly sort of chasing that high because the initial high, the initial euphoric experience, is often one of the more powerful ones, mm. and and as you have a series of them, it sort of starts diminishing, and then you need more of them, and that's what which you is yeah you, know, you know classic sort of addiction anyway yeah that's right that's right it, it acts very similar even if we don't if we do or don't want to call it an addiction whatever it acts the same damn way. Um, so getting out of that, getting the truth of what all, all that was about blew all that out of the water. I have zero desire for any of that stuff. I will never in my life pick up those cans again or go in for some auditing session. I think that would be insane with given what I know about it now. Um, you know, are there other things in life that cause that? Sure. You know, go get drunk, <laughs> you know, go get high. I mean, there's lots of ways to induce euphoria. You know, sometimes watching a movie or a TV show will do that. I mean, I have all kinds of powerful emotional experiences. Getting married was certainly an awe inducing experience for me. You know, that kind oh, of, thing. Yeah. So, you know, so there's lots of ways to have very, very healthy euphoric awe experiences. In fact, we analogize falling into a cult very much the same way as falling in love. Similar chemical, right. similar process. You know, it's just when you're falling for a cult, you're falling for something that's really bad for you that's presenting as though it's amazing for you. And the, I think there's so much to be said for the things that go on in your brain. I mean, Daniel here says, I certainly missed the highs from Christian worship music for a long time. I had to taper myself off it. Yeah. And um, uh, and James, again, sort of chips in with the true yard, bookmark scientific studies about how religious practices activate the same parts of the brain as hard drugs. Yep. Uh, I, I've talked to people and, uh, you know, I've, I've had friends speak to me. In fact, one of them's in the in the in the thread there to talk to me about their really strong religious experiences, giving them a sense, you know, that, that might lead you to believe that there's a that there is a truth to this religious religion. Right. You know, so for example, some Christian uh, religious experience and thinking yeah, the, I I'm definitely accessing something, some higher power or something. Or something. Exactly. Which, it's um, all in the interpretation of the event. And, that's and I, it, yeah. Yeah. And I was just going to say, I've, I've had those experiences, but, but they sound the way I ex explain them would, would to a religious person go, Oh, that's rubbish. That's not, but I've literally, I've seen like, I have certain bands that are like, I, I was a music freak as, uh, growing up and, and yeah. I've got a huge voluminous music collection and the certain bands mean an awful lot to me. And, and when I've seen them in like a dozen times or whatever, and, and I like go to the concerts and I am with like, 10 20 000 other people ch singing this is chanting uh, singing yeah. the same songs like that evoke uh, emotional memories with the sounds and right. and th these times and before it. and i'm in the zone like i've literally right now look i've got goosebumps all just <laughs> thinking about it right so like um, being in there it was surrounded by those people with the band just go into a higher level of awesomeness. That's then right. I, I have had religious experiences, right? I, that, that to me, I, I've been in utter euphoria. Like I can't have imagined being, apart from maybe you know sexual euphoria, being in in a, in a in a higher state of being than than in those moments, right? Because that <laughs> means to me more than anything. You know, this is my religion. This is my religious experience and so although to someone who's maybe a christian involved in these religious experience thinking that saying that's rubbish that's nothing no for me that's the zone right that's for right. you that was a zone and these are all similar accessing the same kind of feelings with neurotransmitters and neurochemicals but it's the same kind of stuff same 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 Across the boards, it's all the same. And that's why I don't call it a religious experience, because a religious experience is just another interpretation. Great point. Uh, uh, it's euphoria. That's what it is. Yeah. It's, a, it's a chemical process and an emotional process. And often, as you just amazingly correctly pointed out, a group process. Mm. It's a social phenomena as much as it is an individual phenomena in, in many circumstances or instances. And that's where, with a cult especially, the social system reinforces it. 
and makes it even more powerful. That's what love bombing is all about. If you've ever heard of that, right? Where yeah. they just like, throw all this admiration and love at you and tell you you're the greatest person ever and admire the hell out of you. They are inducing an awe, euphoria experience in you. So you'll think this group is the best thing that's ever happened to you. Yeah. And when you're watching a band, of course, you, you've got this idea that this person is a great, he's my idol. You know, you've, there's so many religious like parallels. And that's like, great. yeah, it's just, I've just, yeah, really interesting. That's fine. Um, oh, well, look, as, as we come to the end, any final questions, please get them in right now. Um, uh, and I just want to add to that with what Daniel says. Um, with Christian worship, it's so intense because you sing the same songs every Sunday. So that's yeah. that repetition. You were talking about how important repetition is and, and rituals and mantra. And it, there's lots of interesting psychological um, literature on rituals and the, and the functional part that rituals play in religion and in psychology. Um, and when you sing the same song in a crowd of thousands, there's a huge dopamine buzz of unity. Yeah. Big time. Big time. Yeah, every, we're we're all talking the same same language here perfectly. Yeah. And as Rob says, who is actually the uh, religious guy I was referring to earlier, um, there are many ways to touch a transcendent. Uh, and of course, it depends how you define transcendent. But yes, like I would argue that if that's a language you use, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Um, look, this has been an absolutely fascinating discussion. I really, really appreciate the time you have spent with me. Um, what uh is uh, the one final question if you if you would indulge me is that okay yeah yeah go for it yeah so i uh, just talking about uh, like for me I, I i talk about religions in terms of like and i know some people diss on on like memes as an idea but i like the idea of memes being similar to genes ideas will will are memes like uh genes in, in the fact that they are ideas that if they convey some kind of and advantage to the person thinking them, then they will stick around right sure. and and when you have a group of memes like a religion a group of ideas you can call it a meme plex and i talk about uh religions being meme plexes you can use whatever language you like but that i i i talk about something called a mimetic failsafe which are these things to keep you in or to stop you leaving. And the mimetic failsafes for, for religion are heaven and hell. And they are so supremely powerful because there's nothing greater or worse in human conception than heaven and hell. They're literally conceptually the greatest and worst things ever. Yep. And so by leaving a given religion, if you're going to possibly go to hell for doing that, and by staying in it, possibly go to heaven or probably go to heaven, those are really powerful tools. What what are the most powerful tools that keep? Uh, and I know we've mentioned them already, but maybe just draw together what we talked about. You know, the cognitive dissonance reduction stuff. What are the most powerful tools, or, or rewards, or benefits that keep you in uh, Scientology? And when you're in Scientology, what are the biggest pitfalls of leaving? If you don't know about the fair gaming and stuff, you know what keeps you in Scientology. What are the well, it's a carrot. It's that carrot you're chasing, right? Scientology is all about personal spiritual freedom and immortality. Realized, not just thought about or theoretically, but actually realized immortality that you know you are a spiritual being who is never going to die. And freedom from, in, in a similar way to the Buddhist tradition, as Westerners understand it at least, of breaking free from the cycle of life after life after life after life. And you're just stuck in this rat race, you know, hamster wheel of, of, of lives after lives after lives, right? And you can never get out. This is why Scientology refers to planet Earth and this whole universe a bit as a prison planet, as a place you're stuck, you're trapped here, you can't get out. And Scientology is offering and promising you the only road out of this mess. And according to Scientology's ultimate literature, this is hell. Yeah. You're trapped in it right now. And this is the way out. And here's the path. And all you got to do is follow it, which means you got to cooperate. You got to do what we tell you and you got to pay when we tell you to pay. And for those prices, which is basically giving up all of your freedoms and all of your money and all of your time and all of your energy, you will get boundless rewards. <laughs> well, that's really interesting because actually there are really, I didn't think there were 
these i thought there was more psychological into more social psychological and money and stuff like that cognitive dissonance reduction all those kind of things which you all talked about rather than heaven and hell but again, but i wasn't thinking in terms of the 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 ultimate goal of immortality yeah. which i haven't i haven't really seen that as a big thing in in but but so i've said well, what they what they say when they're afraid of getting kicked out of Scientology or afraid of, of, of being kicked out or leaving is Scientologists will say the words, but I don't want to lose my eternity. I'm going to lose my eternity. And, and, and by that is everything I just said. That's and and that's it because for me. So I've I've been saying recently that literally the only reason, say for example, Christianity, but I could pick a, a, any number of religions. The only re real reason Christianity exists uh, and powerfully so is because it promises the afterlife. So if you took away heaven and hell, if you took away eternal existence in the afterlife, yep. Christianity would just fall away. You, you could you, yeah, there's redemption and sin and atonement and Jesus and all this kind of stuff. But actually, that's that's really not very important in terms because actually most people don't even understand that it's about your access to eternity in heaven uh, and and that's the power of christian and in most major religions the reason why judaism is a tiny religion comparatively to, to to people don't realize how small judaism is i think the three abrahamic religions judaism's tiny right and it because it doesn't offer those afterlife like sweeteners that that christianity and islam do and, and that's the power and so for you to say that actually that is an important component of the scientology is really interesting yeah it's the yeah. ultimate threat right because if i take scientology away from you i'm dooming you yeah but okay what happens to like babies that die well they just go get another body hopefully come back around the i you know there's so yeah. many you know little twists in all of this i mean you know th there's an awful lot of patting themselves on the back because they found scientology or were aware enough to make their way into a scientology organization and there are even and i have to admit right now i did this i did this as a scientologist is they will believe that they were a scientologist in the past life and they're just coming back now, right? Because as a as a spiritual entity, they're somehow, some way, wise enough, smart enough, aware enough that they found this path, and it wasn't really an accident, you know. Because we didn't really talk about the auditing process of releasing those suppressed memories. What what's the term for it? There's a natural psychological term. I forget now. Um, but of, of those suppressed memories of, of those previous lives that I think oh, yeah, is an whole, I call it false memory induction personally, but yeah, it's, it's cause it's, it's, it's nonsensical. I mean, you're remembering blowing up planets, you know, 20,000 million years ago. I mean, it's the, 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 the timing of these things is insane. None of this agrees with any science at all. You know, Hubbard talks about the physical universe being four quadrillion years old. It's a good number. Uh, I like it. Big number. Like right? it, yeah. Pretty much near infinity. I mean, no human being can really think with a million, much less a trillion or a quadrillion. So, it, you know, for all intents and purposes, you've been kicking around here for eternity. And, you know, it's going to, and, and if you want to go out of here and get out of this universe and bust free of all of this, you got to do the Scientology, right? Yeah. And there you go. Well, look, Chris, uh, massive, massive kudos for um, for taking part in this. Really, really do appreciate it. Um, this has been really fascinating. Uh, and I'd love at some point in the future, there's so much more to talk about still, I'm sure. Uh, if, if you have time some months down the road, I, I'd love to continue and maybe, you know, go into some greater depth of those things. Um, where can people find you? Do you want people to find you? <laughs> yes, of course, please. Of course you do. Uh, yeah, check out my uh, my YouTube channel. That's where you know tons of content is located. I mean, literally thousands of videos on this topic. Uh, it's a big called. white screen there. Oh, there yeah. It is. Yeah. yeah. And um, let's see. You have um, my um, my blog, mncriticalthinking.com, um, and uh, I have a book that I've written called Scientology A to Zenu. An Insider's Guide to What Scientology is Really All About. So if you want to check that out, it's on Amazon as an audio, e, or print book. Oh, and uh, yeah. 
and you want to know about Scientology, that book will tell you all about it. It's, it's not my memoir. It's a critical analysis of Scientology. So there you go. Is, uh, there it is. Look at that. And great <laughs> reviews. So uh, happy days. Everyone should go out and grab that book. Um, uh, Scientology, A to Zenia. I like what you've done there. Thank you. Um, excellent. Um, brilliant. Well, look, I hope everyone um, uh, subs to his channel. Uh, and uh, please go and support all the work he does. I mean, he's a, he's a much far bigger channel than, than I am and probably will ever be. But, you know, there you go. We all start somewhere. Hey, we all um, start somewhere, man. <laughs> Well, look, fantastic. Um, I, I appreciate you being here. I usually do quick fire questions. We, we've been talking long enough. You've got a life to go to. Uh, I will ask you uh, maybe just my normal last quick fire question. Yeah. So you're just about to have your face eaten off by a zom uh, pack of zombies. You get managed to because you're a prepper. You manage to get down to your um, bunker underneath your house. But you have time to just take three people with you, dead or alive. Uh, the not not members of family or friends. Who, which three people would take? Would you take to a bunker for a month? Wow! And anybody? Yeah, anyone. Um, Carl Sagan, because he's like a oh, hero. Good choice. Um, wow! What an interesting question. Uh, who else? And not family. Not not and not friends. Okay. Okay. Um, wow! Wow! Interesting question. You know, if there was, I mean, just for grins, if I could really choose from history. Yeah. Uh, Jesus, whoever he was, if he, if there was one. Yeah. There's a question Al to me. Always. I, I've said that before. It's like, uh, yeah. you know, I, I have my pat three, but actually I wouldn't mind taking Jesus. I like, mean, no, it's not, not it. a God on your side, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, if, while we're, you know, playing fantasy here, Buddha. Jesus, Buddha, and Carl Sagan. That's what right. an eclectic mix. I love it. <laughs> uh, uh, brilliant. Thank you so much for VA Vaguely Agnostic. He's become a member of the channel. Please, uh, if you want to become a member, there are some small perks there for you. I am, I'm not full of perks uh, uh, because I'm just me and I'm just trying to make my way in the world. But if you want to support my channel, please do uh, join my growing uh, list of members. Uh, and uh, yeah. So there you go. Thank you for those for answering those questions. As ever, guys, um, as I always say, question everything, but particularly yourselves. And no more so than if you think you might be in a cult. Uh, uh, if, you, if you do join my uh, YouTube channel, it's not a cult. We're just friends. And, um, um, you know, I won't make you become a member and then beat you for not taking part. Um, but there you go. I might do. I don't know. Anyway, uh, cheers, everybody. Take care. And thanks for, for the, your um, uh, lively chat in the side. Uh, so uh, please check out the channel for uh, new and upcoming content. But I will be on holiday for a couple of weeks soon. So, you know, I uh, don't know what's going to happen there. Anyway, thanks, Chris. You take care, everybody.